Hello, everyone. Thank you for watching this broadcast. I am really thrilled to be joined by Minnesota State Senator Julia Coleman, who, funny enough, is someone I've known for a very long time. She was previously a field representative with me at the Leadership Institute. I believe it was fall 2014, so many years ago, in a political lifetime. And we've become friends through the years. And I'm perfectly fine with disclosing that. I think it's important to be transparent. But I think it's important to bring lawmakers like her who are making waves to talk about what they've been up to. She's a first term state senator, and she is the youngest woman ever elected to state Senate, regardless of political party in Minnesota, which is really cool. She's done some pageantry work. She was previously in city council. She is a mom to three boys under three or under four. I think I think your older son is under now two. under two. How old is Adam now? He's 21 months. Oh my gosh. I was thinking he was like four years old. Okay. So, so, uh, mom to three under two, which is incredible. And she's going to talk about that story and kind of her thinking on the future of the Republican party, how to encourage more Republican women to run for office and just anything else that we think of. So Julia, Senator Coleman, thank you so much for joining and speaking with me. It's good to catch up with you as well. Thank you. And I think, you know, you were so kind in saying I worked with you. I actually worked for you. I know. You my boss. <laughs> so it's great to um, be here and chatting with you um, I, virtually, but uh, it's great to see your face nonetheless. I know it's been forever since that. I think I haven't seen you since I think that fall time or shortly yeah. afterwards, it's been ages, but you've been doing tremendous work. You're not just someone who's just yakking about politics. You actually really took politics into account and you wanted to be a change maker, which prompted you to get involved even beyond your work with Leadership Institute. So talk about that process and what led you to contemplate and, and start public service. Yeah, I think that I'm always, I've always been the type of person who can't just sit back and complain about an issue and hope that somebody else will step up to the plate to do something about it. I have always been the type of person where if I see a problem, I jump in, I get my hands into the, you know, fixing of the issue. And so when uh, I was feeling a sense in my community and that they weren't being heard, that they were having such a hard time getting through the gridlock at their city hall, why would I wait for someone to step up and try to fix that? So I decided to team up with two other people running and you know, run as a ticket and say, we three are going to run for, let's see, there's mayor, two city council spots, and we're gonna give you a voice. And that's what we did. We created a new citizen-led commission. We made sure that people had a voice at city hall. I had monthly open office hours where anyone could, you know, if you don't want to come to the council chambers, you could just come meet me at a coffee shop and talk about the problems with your local government. And so it was a really great experience. It was a great way to get involved in my local community. Um, and then, you know, the rest was kind of history from there. And how many years were you on city council before you decided to run for the state senate? So I was on the Chanhassen City Council from 2018 to 2020. Um, about a year into my term there, I was eight months pregnant when my state senator announced he was retiring. And I thought, great, you know, there are a lot, lot of great state representatives that could hop into the race that I would fully support and was really waiting for someone that I would believe in and trust with that responsibility to get into the race. Um, I could not walk without waddling. I had no plans to run for anything, like at all, <laughs> figuratively or actually. <laughs> and so, it was not on my radar and I didn't see anybody that I believed in get into the race. And so it decided, you know, I don't like the trajectory that Minnesota is on. I wanna be a part of creating a Minnesota that I can be proud to leave my son. And so a week before he was born decided I'm not waiting, I'm gonna run and announced that I was running. And a week later he was born and he has known nothing but campaign trail or mom voting and working. And he loves it. He, um, we had remote voting this session and he would put his thumbs up and go, I, I, <laughs> he knows how to vote uh, as well. They didn't count his vote, but he, of course. <laughs> he, he loved it. And so it's been great to have him, you know, experience that as well, get out into the world and see people see his mom trying to make a difference for him. And um, found out I was pregnant with the twins right before I actually got elected to the state Senate. And so that just gave me two more reasons to, to fight as hard as I could. 
And you just completed your first session with the Minnesota State Senate. Could you give everyone kind of a recap of what you accomplished? And I think for context, it probably does lean more to the left. It's a Democrat legislature. And I don't know in terms of how difficult it is to get legislation, but talk about some of your accomplishments, some challenges you noticed. What was your first impressions of your first term so far, first year so far? Yeah, you know, it was a really interesting experience because of COVID. So it was an empty building. We were shut out from the public, essentially. Everyone had to vote either remotely or we were spaced apart throughout the entire Capitol building. And it was difficult to build relationships that way. Not impossible, but it was definitely a unique first year that no other class of freshmen have had to experience. But that didn't stop us from getting the work done, getting the job done. It just made it so there were a couple extra hurdles along the way. And you're right, it is a, um, a little bit of a challenge because the Senate holds the, um, the or Republicans hold the Senate and Democrats hold the House and the governor's seat. So it's mm. really two against one. So by definition, everything we passed had to be bipartisan. And so that made for an interesting freshman experience as well. Every bill I had to reach out across the aisle and find somebody to work with or vice versa. You know, they would need Republican sponsors in the Senate. And so we'd have to work on each piece of legislation to get to a point where both sides were uh, in agreement with it. And so, you know, one of the things that I was uh, most proud of this session um, for decades, there is this highway in my district that every senator and representative has been trying to get funding for. Um, it has never happened. And it is one of the deadliest places in my district because, you know, the crash rate is so high and the fatality rate amongst that crash rate is so high. And it's a two lane highway. Well, there's semi trucks and congestion and cars coming through these little towns almost uh, speeding down them. And it really needed to be expanded to four lanes. I mean, it is not uncommon to drive through the district and see a little white cross memorializing someone who passed away there because it's such mm -hmm. a dangerous intersection. And for decades, we could not get anything to happen. Um, and my very first year, I got $25 million for my district to expand that highway from two lanes to four lanes. And so that was huge and you know i'm not a big fan of construction or traffic but i really look forward to sitting in that construction traffic and seeing those orange traffic cones go up because i know what that means to my community um so getting that done was uh, was wonderful and uh, another thing that i was really excited about you know i believe if we are the party of family values we have to do more to support the family and that includes supporting mothers in the workforce and so I was able to get a bill passed this year that made it so moms no longer have to choose between feeding their babies or maintaining their income. In Minnesota, you did not get paid while you were taking pumping breaks, um, which if you've ever done that before, you know it is not a break, it is work, and it's trying to feed your kids. Um, and so you now get paid while you're taking pumping breaks um, in Minnesota. And so that way moms, especially moms who are working, you know, lower income, lower hourly wages, don't have to decide if they want to feed their baby or, you know, put food on the table for the rest of their family. So I was really excited to, to get that one accomplished as well. And so well, just a lot of great bipartisan legislation happened this year. Everyone ended a little happy, a little unhappy, and that is the nature of of compromise and negotiations and working across the aisle. And did you sponsor anything to kind of maybe rein in the governor? I think you had uh, supported some legislation to make sure his emergency powers were in check. Were you, what, what was something like that that you did that uh, maybe got some notice? I know you went on Fox and Friends in the morning uh, mm -hmm. some time ago to talk about different things. So did you do anything that attracted even um, national coverage as well? Yes, um, in Minnesota, we were... I believe one of the first or the only um, groups to rein in the governor's power to end his emergency powers. And so we were really proud of, of that. The governor here held on to them far longer than was ever necessary. Um, and, and one has to wonder why. And so we ended his emergency powers. It was actually quite comical in the middle of the night when the governor knew this was going to happen. He quick sent out a press release in the middle of the night saying, I, I'm giving up my emergency powers. <laughs> I said, sure you are. We're going to end them officially just to make sure. And, and so we were really excited about that. And we have 
passed bills in the Senate um, to make sure that this type of situation isn't going to be possible in the future, that the governor can't just unilaterally close our schools, um, that we as a legislative body have more say on emergencies. Now that didn't get through the Democratic House and it obviously would have been vetoed by our governor, but we're going to keep on those efforts. I think it was a very eye-opening experience for a lot of people who maybe don't normally pay attention to politics to see the importance of limited government. They got to experience firsthand that their own governor can take away their children's education, can take away their right to work and put food on the table for their families. And so, um, and it was an eye-opening experience for lawmakers who never saw an emergency being abused in this way. And so we're working on that legislation still and, and hopefully Democrats will go back to their constituents and hear that we don't want this um, to be a free, a free for all when you have emergency powers. We want it to be more limited in scope and we want all 201 Minnesota legislators to have a say in it and they'll work with us next session, but we'll keep trying until then. That's a lot of cautious optimism. And in the midst of your first year being a freshman lawmaker, you also juggled giving, thankfully miraculously, birth to two beautiful twin identical boys and it was kind of hard. I remember you chronicling it and you you and your husband took a very brave step in going public with your journey, the kind of complications you guys had down the road. But mm-hmm. all in all, luckily, thankfully, the boys came out fine. They're growing. They're making up for lost time. They were prematurely born. Uh, so talk about that process. And you had mentioned, and I think have talked about it a little, that I think the doctor encouraged you for, they claimed under the guise of your health and for the betterment of the twins, you'd have to eliminate one of the twins. What is that procedure? And that sounds just so sinister to anyone, regardless of where you fall on the abortion issue. I'm pro-life. I know you are too, but I think even mm-hmm. pro-choicers can be like, that's crazy. Especially the fact that the boys have made tremendous strides to be healthy. They've grown um, despite against doctor's recommendations. So talk about that and talk about, how, like I said, juggling three kids under three as well. Yeah, so like I said, my little guy was a year old. We were coming towards the end of the campaign for the state Senate, and I found out I was expecting. I didn't know it was twins at the time, but um, shortly after the election, found out, it was, oh my gosh, there's two in there. And it was um, identical twins, which are amazing, but they can come with a lot of complications. And particularly identicals more than fraternal twins. It has to do with their connection to the placenta and mom and um, we about 16 weeks into our pregnancy journey, um, you know, got had that conversation you never want to have with a doctor and they come in the room and say there's something wrong. And we found out our boys were facing two conditions in utero, one called twin to twin transfusion syndrome and selective intrauterine growth restriction for our baby A. And we went to, we got a lot of opinions. Um, we wanted to make sure that you know, we were fully informed about everything going on. And one of the doctors that we met with said, well, you can almost guarantee baby B's survival if you do selective reduction on baby A. And what selective reduction is, is they go in and they sever the ties between the two boys. So they're not sharing any connection or blood. And then they cut the umbilical cord of the baby you want and they let it pass. Um, Basically suffocate to death, essentially. And that... The reason they do that is so if something happens to baby A, it doesn't affect baby B. Um, But we said, we're not, and we instantly said, no, we're not choosing between our sons. There's there's no situation which that's gonna happen. We have to have faith that, you know, everything's a part of God's plan. If they both pass, that's a part of God's plan. If they both make it, that's a part of it too. And we, we, I talked to my brother too. and, And while we were never considering the selective reduction, I did talk to him about, you know, gosh, they make you feel like you're going to kill both your babies if you don't kill one of them. And he said, you know, if I had a twin, I'd want to fight it out with them. I'd want to stick it out with them. I wouldn't care if I was born prematurely. It's my brother. And I I think your boys will feel the same way. And that made me feel better about our decision um, for sure. And then they said, there's no way you're going to make it past 28 weeks. Um, I started going into preterm labor at 24 weeks and we made it to 28 weeks and then we made it to 30 and then we made it to 32. And then our baby, a, my, my son, Charles, he just, his, his growth was really bad. And so we decided to take him out 
and we finished the legislative session on midnight and May 17th, and my boys were born at 1 p.m. on May 18th, so they uh, timed it out perfectly. <laughs> That's incredible. And judging by your posts on their progress, they have, I think Charles has grown tremendously. He's caught up with his brother and it's just miraculous. And how, I guess, rash to judgment, rash judgment that sometimes medical professionals make, I don't know where it comes from, but the fact that the, both of the boys are now healthy, they're on the right trajectory. Uh, it, it is quite sinister. I mean, I don't know if they put in their personal politics on the life issue, at hand, I don't know why they were trying to encourage that to you if it was truly round, uh, founded in medical advice, but the fact that they, you were able to prove them wrong, um, what does that go to show? You know, obviously the power of prayer, um, the fact that you don't have to sacrifice one kid for another. Sometimes medical opinion is wrong and that's good. You guys consulted your doctors about what best approaches to take. And did those doctors come back to you and say, well, maybe we were wrong to recommend selective reduction. Did, did they say that? Did they admit their fault or no, you haven't heard anything regarding that? No, we, we haven't been in touch with that doctor since. Um, <laughs> maybe we smart. decided not to go with that physician after that. And um, yeah, you know, you want proof of intelligent design. Our boys, their heads are the exact same size because our Charles pushed every nutrient, every ounce of blood he had to his head to protect his brain. So their heads are the exact same size and the Charles's body is quite tiny. He's mm. about four pounds lighter than James, but he's gonna be just fine. He'll catch up, he'll grow. And you know, somehow that little tiny baby knew to protect the most important part of himself and is, you know, gonna, you know, my, my husband's six, five. So even if he ends up short, it'll be like six feet for him. So he's going to be, <laughs> he'll be, he'll be a big boy, no matter whether or not he catches up with his twin and their bond is something else. It is something so beautiful to see how they just are drawn to each other and connect with each other. And I cannot imagine having to look James in the eyes and say, well, I killed your brother in, in right next to you. And you grew along next to his little dead body. And it's just, it's horrific that that's even an option for twin parents. Uh, it is, and I've talked to many mothers of multiples, it is encouraged uh, frequently with triplets, especially mm. uh, to increase the rate of them surviving by by killing one of them. And so it, it is definitely something that I think the medical community needs to look inward and say, why are we encouraging this? Uh, is one life really more valuable than the other? And is, I mean, this, what is this gonna do mentally to children that are designed to have such a close connection? So yeah, it was definitely a, a pro-life story for them. And, uh, you know, something we can get into another time, my husband, what, his mom was encouraged to get rid of him. So we have um, a lot of success stories in this family and, and reasons to support life. That's so encouraging. And I, I hope anyone watching, taking that away can see that you can practice your pro-life values uh, through something as complicated as this, as, as twin births or multiple births are. I haven't had any kids, but I, I understand um, it is more risky having twins. But the fact that you were able to stay positive and uh, be able to deliver them early even though prematurely, but they've been catching up. It goes to show that multiple factors can be at play. And sometimes doctors are wrong. I hate to say that and challenge medical opinion since I'm not a doctor, but I think sometimes they are, they can be inaccurate. Um, I hope it's not rooted in politics because I know some of the medical community are inclining themselves more to kind of this divisive political thinking. Some of them are outwardly for abortion and they'll recommend that to their patients. And I, I would hate to think that you have to think, okay, is my doctor pro-life or pro-choice or pro-abortion? Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of scary to think that they may be trying to weave it into their, to their practice, which would be very disconcerting. They shouldn't be trying to influence people in that regard. You've been able to persevere and the boys are developing beautifully. And I mean, being a working mother, I think, I think many people don't think that Republican women can do it all. We certainly can. Uh, being a conservative woman too, especially in politics. And, and you're living proof of that. I know plenty of other countless young mothers who are doing it. What do you say to young women, let's say, who are contemplating running for office or getting involved in the political process? What is your advice to them before we talk about kind of what you think the future of the party is or conservative movement is in Minnesota and then also nationally? You know, I was just having this conversation with some of my female colleagues the other day. You know, what, what can we do to get more moms to step up to the plate? And one of them who she also had a, a baby in the legislature, um, actually while I was an intern in the Senate, she pointed out that when women run, 
if we have 20 things that have to be checked off before we say it's a good time, if 19 of them are checked off, we will not run because that one box isn't checked. And so encouraging women through our own stories of, look, I didn't have all the boxes checked. Eight and a half months pregnant was not the right time to run in my mind on my little checklist list, but you just have to dive in. If you truly believe in what you believe in, you want to fight, you just have to take a leap of faith and know that your village will come support you and your family, that the timing will work out if you feel a call in your heart to serve, and that, you know, there's something so rewarding about having a say in the future you're going to leave your children and directly working on the legislation that's going to do that, directly having these conversations about the culture that we're raising them in um, and using your um, platform to do so. And so we're going to, I think, all have to reach out to women that we think would be great legislators and encourage them. Most men will just run. And that's one of the things we love about men is that they just you know, get in there and do the work right away. Women on average have to be asked seven times to run for office. Really? And so go ask a woman you think would be great seven times today, encourage <laughs> her, offer the support that she's gonna need and um, you know, send her my way. I would love to talk to moms that are interested in running, but aren't sure if it's going to work out. And, you know, I can have three little boys under the age of two and the toddler, I mean, let's be honest, toddler boys are one step above a feral animal. Uh, If I can do it, you can do it. And I'm happy to help you figure out the logistics. We just have to have, and I've seen this firsthand, the importance of having that young mom voice in all bodies that are making decisions. Um, We have to have your voice. So please run. Um, I think I've asked you twice now. So five more times. (laughs) That's very good advice. And I'll defer people to you if they have questions about running for office from the local level. And I also think some people get a little too ambitious where they just start running outright for the Senate, U.S. Senate or Congress, and they haven't gotten their political chops. So maybe you can encourage people to start at the local level and then work their way up a little bit. It's, it's not about waiting your turn, but I think you do have to have some local experience before you do make the jump, unless the factors really are at your advantage to run for something as, um, I would say, notable as Congress or the Senate. But I, I, I do encourage people to at least have a little bit of political experience, at least behind the scenes working for lawmakers too, um, before you jump into, because it's very difficult. And if you're going up against a very powerful incumbent, even on the Republican primary side, uh, and then you kind of forfeit and you lose in that respect, and then you try to run again, and then people kind of get tired of people who run multiple times and you lose. So I think starting local and then working your way up, I think is a good strategy. I don't know if you agree with that, but that's an approach that you've taken and I've seen that's where success really does kind of come into play with running for office. And actually, I don't know if you've noticed this um, for the congressional level, this is a little out of your wheelhouse, but there have been, I think, a historic number of Republican women who've declared their intention to run, um, whether it is facing Democrats in swing districts and even sometimes challenging incumbents in the Republican Party, too. So we're seeing a lot more women. And we had a lot of gains this Congress, going into this Congress. I think there's now the highest level of women serving in the U.S. Congress, including the U.S. Senate, too. I think they count both. But we we made a lot of gains in the Congress. So it's very encouraging to see that I think people are not underestimating Republican conservative women anymore. What is your impression when you see women, they could be mothers, working mothers, they could be young working mothers like yourself. What does that kind of symbolize to you um, that people are hearing out conservative women, that conservative women maybe have a different interesting take that people are considering Uh, people are inclining themselves to them because we do get stuff done (laughs) sometimes a little bit better than men. Uh, But, but but why do you think more people are gravitating towards conservative women candidates? You think? I think that they see the intent behind running. I think for a lot of us, the reason isn't ambition. The reason isn't, um, you know, for our own self-serving purposes, the reason is our children. And they see that they say, she's going to fight for my family like she's fighting for her own. And I think that's why we are gravitating towards that. We're seeing our family values being attacked left and right. So we see a mom who's going to fight for those family values because she's got a family to fight for back home. So I really think it is that we have the purest of intents and people are really looking for that in the public servants. That's true. And also true of men too. It's not that we're just trying to downplay men. There there are some very good conservative lawmakers who are men as well. But I think um, with marketing, it's same within politics. 
when you can see someone like yourself in a position that kind of compels you to want to possibly pursue that position too. I, I wouldn't say that's necessarily in my experience for work, but when I did see conservative women genuflecting or possibly discussing topics or going into different areas that I focus on, I'm like, I can kind of indirectly like be inspired to pursue this if I work hard at it. Um, some people more directly see the impact of looking up to someone from afar or closely if they have some sort of mentorship relationship with them. So it is true when you can see yourself in a position and the person is doing great, they're getting good notice. They're not just getting attention for the sake of attention. They're actually trying to make an impact. I think that does signal to women and even men too, that you can do anything your mind that you put your mind to. And you just need to have some gumption. You need to have some courage and you need to develop a grassroots network as well if you're trying to run for political office. So yeah, I think when when more conservative women start to see themselves in political office, then that signals to them, yes, I can run for office. And hey, I can even win too if I'm really a hard worker and have a good team behind me. Absolutely. I wholeheartedly agree. And I think that's it's a snowball effect. We're seeing some women get involved and then more women see them and then they think they can do it and I think you hit the nail on the head there you 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 have to see it to believe it and we're really starting to see it and it's beautiful I want to talk about Minnesota with you because Minnesota has historically been a very politically interesting place uh 2016 and 2020 have been interesting stark contrast where Trump almost won in 2016 miraculously but in 2020 he lost by double digits and I can understand why that was because probably they were able, the union vote probably was able to turn out more people in that race. And they were, were very uncomfortable with Minnesota being close, but Minnesota has gone kind of back and forth sometimes with Republican Democrat politicians. I know maybe there is some sort of appetite for perhaps change politically. I know one of the congressional seats went from Democrat to Republican. It was a more conservative Democrat, um, Colin Peterson. And now it's a uh, Michelle Congresswoman, Fishback. yes, mm -hmm. she took a seat. So congressionally, there have been some strides made, some gains made a little bit. And you said that the state Senate is in Republican control. I don't know what your purview is into the governor's race. We won't have to talk about that. But do you see Minnesota potentially in the future, maybe starting to embrace Republican principles in the back? Do you think it's shifted so far to the left with especially the riots that have happened, um, just the uptick in crime, perhaps some of the policies that have been very deleterious to your population? Um, the lack of support for some of the mining interests up north in the uh, boundary waters, or um, maybe perhaps just a pulling away with, with jobs that have moved away to different countries, um, just kind of the Rust Belt feeling the effects of all these different factors at play. Um, so, so what is your kind of view into Minnesota? Like, what is its future? What can those of us outside Minnesota possibly anticipate or hope for the state? Is there some sort of political hope for it to, you know, maybe embrace more limited government, free market, a kind of small government, private property right type individualistic policies? Or is it sadly going to, do you think it's too lost uh, to ever come back or, or to kind of make a comeback? I don't think Minnesota is a lost cause at all. And I think that it's just got to be the right timing um, on multiple fronts. We have to have the right candidates up and down the ballot. And I think that if I were Governor Walls right now, I would be really nervous about my chances of reelection. There are so many people, so many moms, especially, that I have spoken to that, like I mentioned before, don't really pay attention to politics, but then they saw their politician their governor ruined their lives for a year, shut down their business, put their children at home for over a year with their schools and have to see their children miss their friends and have mental health issues as a result of that. And they're mad, they are mad. And they have seen what over powerful government can do to them that they can take away everything you have in your life that you hold so dear. And so they want to get involved. And I think that we have a really good shot of, of winning back the governor's seat um, in this upcoming election. I think they saw our governor weak during the riots, letting our city, our beloved Minneapolis, burn to the ground. They've seen him not come out strong enough for police. People are seeing the immense uptick in crime in our major Twin Cities areas and now starting to come out into the suburbs. They've seen their, like I said, their children and their businesses be affected by this governor and, and they are mad and they are wanting to come out and become delegates and caucus for the first time. They want to get the right person on the ballot to make sure we can beat Tim Walls in um, the upcoming election. And I think that it is possible. 
I don't think that Minnesota is a lost cause. I just think we need the right candidates at the right time. And I really see the stars aligned for that. It's a very interesting forecast. Yeah, I think it is a wild card state just because there are a lot of hardworking people there. It will, it'll be interesting litmus test. I mean, here in Virginia, we're going to see the firsthand effect if that's going to be the case, because we don't have a third party challenger like we did two election cycles ago. It seems to be that all Republicans and centrists and even some on the left are kind of coalescing behind the Republican challenging former Governor Terry McAuliffe. So we'll obviously be the first litmus test to see if if the extremism from the Biden White House and kind of from Democrat control in Congress federally and in different state legislatures will compel people to want to retake their school boards, retake the governor's mansion, to vote out politicians who just disregard uh, common sense policies and just want to enact just draconian measures that keep businesses closed, that keep schools in perpetuity uh, hostage by teachers unions and so much more. And so, yeah, I want to be cautiously optimistic about Minnesota because there are a lot of hunters. There are a lot of good salt of the earth folks there. And I understand union interests control the state very heavily. And it's kind of hard to grapple with. Uh, but but I, I'm a little encouraged by lawmakers like you getting elected, of course, and others uh, who've been flipping seats and just kind of the different uh, makeup that is happening. So I, I don't think you should ever discount a state, especially one that can bounce back from having too much blue <laughs> across the years. And um, something I want to ask you kind of about um, what propelled you to Republican politics. So we kind of hear about these obituaries about the Republican Party. Certainly, we've had some bad moments. Every party has moments, good and bad But I think there is an opportunity for the Republican Party just in response to what we're seeing in Washington now, just the extremism of the left and the supposed moderate President Biden, who not really is moderate. I've I've seen just in my reporting and just the way he's been forced to go hard left and some of the positions he took as senator and also as vice president. And I never really believed he was a moderate. I don't think he's a communist or anything of that nature. Certainly not. He condemned it. Thankfully, he did something good. It took a while for him to condemn, you know, communism in Cuba. Uh, but I do think he is forced to side with very far left elements of his party and Republicans do have an opportunity to seize on that. And I hate to think in terms of politics, like, yes, we can only, we should only think about winning the election, but it should be laying the groundwork for building a movement, not just winning in 22, possibly 2024, but it has to be building a movement. So what issues to you do you think Republicans can win on going forward in more tough states like Minnesota? Um, whether it is local races, federal races. I know school choice has been winning popularity. More people are inclining to school choice. More people are wanting to pick up legal firearms ownership. Uh, Protecting freelancing is something I've been talking about. And I I don't know if you focused on that issue yet, but um, we do see uh, across political lines that people want to protect the right to freelance and to have right to work uh, legislation in place so you don't have to join a union against your will. Uh, There's many, many other issues, but what's on your mind as to how the Republican Party can continue to grow and make some strides, uh, given what was done the last election? We we increased our fold with minority voters, Hispanic voters, especially, too. Um, So not everything was grim, despite losing, of course. But we, we had some inroads that we made, tremendous inroads. And I think the party... Like we we're not white lily, old white people (laughs) in the party. We we're so much more diverse. And I hate to think in terms of that, but we have our ideas attract many people. So what is your thinking in terms of the issues that will resonate? What strategies uh, the Republican Party can take in states like yours and elsewhere uh, to really be successful going forward and building a movement, not just winning electoral victories? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head with the school choice issue. Now, I serve on the K through 12 education committee in the state Senate. And we tried incredibly hard to pass school choice this year and the House Democrats and our governor blocked it from happening. And this issue is incredibly popular across the state. And so I think we have to keep fighting and showing we are working for school choice. We are working to give your children the best opportunities to succeed. They are beholden to the special interests. They are beholden to the union. So who's got your family in mind? Who's got your back here? And so keep pushing it and standing by our principles of school choice, even if we're going to get shut down every single time. I think that one is incredibly important and we should not let that issue go. Another one is public safety. And like I said, the crime in the Twin Cities, uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul, for those who aren't familiar with Minnesota, is spreading out to the suburbs. Um, We're getting notices to make sure you lock your car and then lock the door leading to the garage because people are breaking into cars, pushing the button and getting into your house through the garage. Um, It's it's getting to be scary and people are concerned that they need to 
you know, do something. We need to get a leader to do something because we're not feeling safe in our own homes anymore. So we want to make sure our children are getting the best education possible. We want to make sure they're safe when they lay their heads down to sleep at night. And so those are issues that we have to keep hammering on. We will fight for school choice. We will stand up for our police and we want to fund more police. We, you know, I want to put a cop on every corner until we get our crime under control in the Twin Cities. And so I think that we need leaders to just keep pushing that and show we have your family in mind in every decision that we make. And that will eventually continue to attract more people to our party if we just stand our ground on those issues. Are there any other issues you think Obviously, the right to life is a winning issue. We see more people trending that way. And I think highlighting personal stories like yours, you can tie it to legislation or not to, uh, tie it to legislation per se, but resolutions and be like, I've experienced this firsthand. I know the value of protecting the right to life and why it's so important. And being a young woman, of, of course, you can talk about that as well. But any other issues as well that we should be focusing on, on spending, um, reigning in the debt and deficit? Uh, let's see what else. There could be so many more issues, but anything else you think that's important that the party should focus locally and even nationally going forward? Definitely. You know, one thing that I had on my on my mind when I was setting the budget in city council and now that I serve on the taxes committee in the, in the Senate is talking about how we care about the family budget. Um, you know, I think a lot of people in politics come from money. Um, they are better off. And when we have lawmakers like myself, who I know what it's like to sit down at the kitchen table with my spouse and try to figure out how to make our bills work every time the government opens up our wallet and tries to take more money out. Um, we say, look, we're looking out for your family budget. I think that really resonates with people who are working on tight budgets, who are trying to figure out how to pay for their kids schooling and, and to fill up their gas tank and, and be able to get to work. And, and so by saying, you know, we're the party of looking out for the, your family budget, we want to make sure that you can fill up your gas tank to get to work. We want to make sure that you can afford to put food on the table. We think you know what to do with your money better than we do when it comes to your family and your lifestyle. Um, I think hitting that issue home as well, showing that we really do care about your families and everything we do is going to be a, a winning issue for us. There are so many issues and they're going to come as the new cycle warrants. And I also think sometimes what I'm seeing a little bit on a conservative Twitter, which is not a, exactly a great barometer on everything, um, but I, I see, unfortunately, a inclination to just focus on like just very few issues and be like, that's what we went on. And I'm like, there are multiple issues that you can focus mm -hmm. on and when people... And even issues that are philosophically conservative, but you can get crossover votes like what I've seen with defending the right to freelance, uh, the gun issue starting to now creep into not just Republican politics, but we see more Democrats and independents obviously buying firearms. We see the school choice issue being obviously it has always been historically a very bipartisan issue. Now people have seen with with CRT and just all this indoctrination happening and I mean, I've always been very skeptical of teachers unions. We had a pretty uh, powerful bunch in California. And I, it's amazing that the awakening a lot of parents have had now that they've actually been able to see the curriculum that their kids have had to endure and, and learn from. And uh, now parents are trying to take control over the school boards, which is commendable. It's, it's an arduous challenge, certainly. But I, I really hope that they do. And I think, yeah, there, there are multitude issues that we can all focus on. And it has been so much fun to speak with you about your first year about the wonderful survival story of your beautiful identical twin boys. I hope I get to see you and finally meet your husband who, I don't know if people know this, your husband is actually the son of former Senator Norm Coleman, uh, which is really cool. I didn't see that. I didn't notice that in, at first. And I was like, oh my gosh, wow, that's really <laughs> cool. And uh, he's he seems like a very lovely guy and, and you did very well in the husband department. And uh, no, you, you've been blazing a trail. I'm so impressed by you. And I'm just so happy to see like you moving from being my field rep to being this kick-ass state lawmaker and your future is really bright. I hope you do pursue down the road, higher office. Maybe you may run for Congress or something in the future. That'd be really cool to see, but I don't want to <laughs> get you, get you, you know, to do anything too preemptively. Oh, but Julie you know, the three little guys right now, I'm just trying to survive <laughs> day by day. Right. And, uh, we would love to, to have you out uh, to Minnesota, Gabriella. I think you got to experience some ice fishing. I do. Yeah, and I do. Minnesota experience. Yes. And Senator Coleman, where can everyone connect with you, follow your musings and learn more about your work and get inspired to maybe follow your lead? Where can everyone uh, connect with you? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a great place to connect with me on 
on Facebook under Senator Julia Coleman. Um, on my Instagram, it's Julia Aaron Coleman. My mom got really unique with uh, my middle name. It's E-R-Y-N-N. And uh, I'm on Twitter as well. I think it's Julia E. Coleman is, is the handle there. And so um, I'm sure you can link everything and, and find us there. Uh, I love to connect with people, love to connect with women running for office, love to answer any questions other people might have. And uh, if there's any twin moms out there, I love building that community because um, I need all the advice I can get. So um, <laughs> it's been wonderful chatting with you. And, and like I said, come out to Minnesota. We'll, we'll show you how great the Midwest is and how great the state is. I will definitely hold you up on that offer, hopefully next summer, because right now it's a little crazy on my end, but it's a good crazy. So Senator Coleman, always a pleasure. It's too long since we last caught up and I really appreciate your time and taking some time to speak with me while juggling three under three. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you so much.